Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to say congrats for reaching the last section that we will cover, 10.6. I will have an announcement coming soon explaining study week and finals um, and also clarifying that there will be no test for chapter 10. Um, so that's just to help you focus on making up any missing work um, and uh, completing any unfinished exit tickets and that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully that helps take a load off and helps you make up any missing work if you have it. So 10.6 is on uh, binomial distribution distributions um, and there's some vocab that I want to cover at the beginning um, in order to lead up to the rest of the lesson. So we're going to talk about a random variable in the context of probability. Um, the value of a random variable is determined by the outcomes of a probability experiment. So an example when you roll a six-sided die, you can define a random variable x that represents the number that was rolled. So the possible values of x would be just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Those are the only possible values uh, for the random variable x because they represent um, the six different things you could get from rolling the die six different outcomes. Okay, so we're eventually going to talk about a binomial distribution, um, but there's a more general thing called a probability distribution, and I'm going to explain that next. So probability, a probability distribution shows all the outcomes of a probability experiment and their corresponding probabilities. So it shows you the outcomes and their probability. So how does it do that? Well, uh, you can do it in the form of a table or you can have a histogram, but you know you have all the outcomes when you've listed all the possible values for the random variable. So x was our random variable in that example I mentioned of rolling a six-sided die and the possible values of x were one through six. Now. Um, the added part now is that it's a distribution, and so we're also showing the probabilities of each of yeah of each outcome. In this case, each outcome is equally likely. Like rolling a one is just as likely as rolling a four, uh, which is just as likely as rolling a five. So each of these just have a probability of one sixth because there are six possibilities, and there. Are all equally likely. And a super important property of a probability distribution is that the probabilities add up to 1 if you add up all of them. So notice if you add up 1 sixth six times, you're going to get 6 sixths, which is equal to 1. And this should always be the case. If you cover all the cases, um, uh, it should add up to 1. Okay. So here's an example uh, where you end up, or well, where we have to uh, determine some things about a probability distribution. So it says make a table and draw a histogram showing the probability distribution of the random variable x, and they tell us a little bit more about x. They say x is the number um, on a table tennis ball randomly chosen from a bag that contains five balls labeled one, three balls labeled two, and two balls labeled three. Now, um, the last table you saw only included a row for the random variable values and the probabilities. Sometimes uh, the table will also contain uh, a row called 
outcomes, which just says how many times, um, how many different ways that outcome can occur. So here's a table like that, where there's a third, uh, where there's an extra row. Now, x is the number that shows up on the table tennis ball you pick. The only numbers written on the table tennis balls were 1, 2, and 3. So those are the values, uh, the possible values for our random variable x. And that's why they're written right there. Now, this middle column is useful. We didn't have it last time, but it can be useful to just count up how many ways um, an outcome can happen uh, before you think about probability. So how many ways could I draw a table tennis ball out of the bag and it would have a one on it? Well, five different ways because there are five balls labeled with a one. So you could draw any of those five. How many ways could you pull out a table tennis ball and it has a two on it? Well, they told us there are three balls with a two labeled on it, so three different ways, or three different balls that you could take out that would have a two on them. And then how many outcomes um, end up with uh, a table tennis ball labeled with a three? Uh, there are two outcomes that uh, fall in that situation because there are two balls labeled with a three on them. Now, calculating the probability, um, we're just going to think about number of outcomes that satisfy the constraint or constraints over the total number of outcomes. So the total number of outcomes is 5 plus 3 plus 2, um, because there are only three cases, and uh, so we add up these three numbers to figure out the total number of outcomes. 5 out of 10 of the outcomes result in a, a ball labeled with a 1. That reduces to 1 half, or as a decimal, 0 0.5. So again, this 10 on the bottom of the fraction came from the total number of outcomes, which is 5 plus 3 plus 2. So for this one, there are three outcomes um, where you end up with a ball labeled with a 2, and that's out of 10 total outcomes, so as a decimal 0 0.3. And then finally there are two outcomes out of 10 where you would draw a ball labeled with a 3 on it. 2 out of 10 reduces to 1 fifth, which is the same as 0 0.2 as a decimal. Notice that like the example uh, with the six-sided die, that when you add up the probabilities, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, they add up to 1. The probabilities add up to 1 when you add up all of them. And then here's a histogram just to show you what that would look like. Um, in the problems I assign, I don't have you draw a histogram, or I will not have you draw a histogram, but I will have you read a histogram uh, in order to answer a question. So just to make sure you understand how I how one would draw this. The x-axis is the random variable x, so it contain, you know, the possible values for x are 1, 2, or 3. That's why these shows show up down here. And then notice we said that the probability that x is equal to 1 is 0 0.5. That's why this bar right here goes up to 0 0.5. And the probability that um, the random variable x uh, is equal to uh, 2, 0 0.3, that's what we said over here, and notice that this bar goes up to 0 0.3, this last bar goes up to 0 0.2, which matches this probability right here. So here's an example, there will be a very similar problem you have to solve uh, in the exit ticket, but here is an example where you would look at a histogram and answer a question about it. So it says use the probability uh, distribution to determine the probability of spinning an even number. So there's a spinner, 
Um, there are different numbers that the spinner can land on, um, and the different sections of the spinner are not, they don't have even area. So some of the numbers are more likely to land on than others because they take more space uh, than uh, the other sections. So it looks like the spinner can land on a 1, a 2, a 3, or a 4. Only two of those four outcomes are even numbers, like 2 and 4. Um, so we are wondering, if we're wondering, like, when does what's the probability of it landing on an even number? It's basically the probability that it lands on a 2 or the probability that it lands on a 4. There's no overlap here. You can't land on more than one number at a time. So when we're finding the probability of this or this, we just add the probabilities. So we're going to do the probability um, that x is 2 plus the probability that x is 4. Um, in case fractions trip you up, I just want to clarify. Each blue line marks out 1 eighth. Um, so this is 1 fourth right here. Half of 1 fourth is 1 eighth. Each of these, each time you go up a blue line, that's 1 eighth. Um, and like that makes sense because this one is like 2 eighths, which is the same as 1 fourth. So if I'm wondering probability um, that our random variable x is equal to 2, uh, that lines up with 1, 2, 3 eighths. So probability that x is 2 is 3 eighths. The probability that x is 4 lines up with 1 fourth, so that's why I put a 1 fourth right there. And then uh, if you actually divide this out, 3 eighths is equal to this decimal, 1 fourth is equal to 0 0.25. Add those together, you get 0 0.625. All the exit ticket questions will ask you to list probabilities as decimals, so that's why I uh, list it as a decimal here to get you used to that. Okay, now we finally get to um, binomial experiments and binomial distributions, which is what we were leading up to. A binomial experiment meets the following conditions. So, like, I'm just trying to describe what is a binomial experiment. There are n independent trials, so you're going to do something n times. Each trial has only two possible outcomes success and failure. Now they might be called something different in the in the problem but two outcomes. So like success and failure could be like heads uh, or tails um, or um, just any sort of um, thing where there's situation where there's two outcomes um, for each trial. The probability of success is the same for each trial, so that would be true for that example of heads or tails. Every time you flip a fair coin, probability of heads is 0.5. It doesn't change from time to time. So probability of success is always um, represented by p, and the probability of failure is always represented by 1 minus p. Now, this works to find the probability of failure because like always, the two the probabilities need to add up to one, um, and so if p is the probability of success, um, just do one minus that to figure out the probability of failure because um, they have to add up to one. Now, this is kind of a jam-packed formula, so I think seeing some examples will help, but I want you to see it right now. For a binomial experiment, the probability of exactly k successes in n trials looks like this. So we're going to do something n times. Um, the probability of getting exactly n successes uh, can be calculated like this. Now, it uses the combination formula that we learned in section 10.5. So just remember, this was the combination formula we learned in section 10.5. When you see this, 
subscript N, um, a capital C, and then a subscript K, it means that use this formula right here. Okay, so let's use this on a situation so that you uh, can make more sense of it. Remember, n, total number of trials, k, number of successes, p, probability of success, 1 minus p, probability of failure. So, find the probability of flipping a coin 20 times and getting 18 heads. So, here's that formula written again. I don't, unfortunately, have the uh, combination formula written here, but um, if you need to look at that, you can refer back to the last slide. The probability of success is 0 0.5 because our success in this problem is getting a heads, and the probability is 0.5 for that. 1 minus 0.5 is still 0.5, so prob that's also the probability of failure for this problem. Total number of trials is 20. That's how many times we're doing um, the, um, uh, that's how many times we're flipping a coin, and we're wondering what's the probability of 18 heads, or in other words, 18 successes. So plugging in to this formula up here, our n we said was 20, our k we said was 18, both the probability of success and the probability of failure are 0.5. 18 is here because that was another spot where we plug in k, the number of successes. And 2, I, I guess I maybe should have been more explicit about that, but that's n minus k, or in other words, 20 minus 18, which is 2. So, and you can also think of n minus k as the number of failures. If 18 out of 20 are successes, 2 out of 20 are failures. So, I don't want to go into too much detail about simplifying the combination formula, but because um, we did that last time in 10.5, but uh, so if you need help with that, I would refer to those slides and that video. But that's what I'm doing right here, and right here, and right here. One thing I do want to be, uh, you do need to clarify right now is 0 0.5 to the 18th times 0 0.5 squared can be simplified to 0 0.5 to the power of 20. If you have two basically exponential um, expressions multiplied together and they have the same base, you can just add the exponents. That's how I get a 20. So through simplifying, um, this, this uh, combination formula at the beginning eventually simplifies to 190 and then times that 0 0.5 to the power of 20 gives us this. That's not a big probability but getting 18 heads out of 20 flips also doesn't sound very likely, so it is reasonable that we get a small answer right there. Now, I, I don't know if this will click with you yet, but I do just want to mention how I think of this intuitively. Um, ignoring the part at the beginning, the combination formula, this p to the k times 1 minus p to the power of n minus k, that's the probability that like one outcome, uh, like probability of one particular outcome where there are k successes. So maybe, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, 0 0.5 to the 18th down here times 0 0.5 squared. If you pick just one outcome where there are 18 successes, like 
for instance, the first 18 coin flips are heads, and the last two are tails. This is the probability that that one exact outcome happens. Why do we multiply by this? Well, because uh, it turns out that there are 190 different ways um, to have 18 successes and two failures, um, because uh, those two failures could happen, you know, anywhere within the the 20. They could be the first and second coin flip. They could be the first and the last. They could be the fourth and the 17th, uh, where that where those two failures happen. And so this thing at the beginning is how many outcomes are there with that probability? And this part. Uh, is like uh, the probability of one particular outcome. Okay, example four. We're going to use this formula even more. So according to a survey, 27% of high school students in the United States buy a class ring. You ask six randomly chosen high school students whether they own a class ring. Fill in the table of the binomial distribution for your survey. So to clarify, the random variable here is x, and it's the number of students in your survey who own a class ring. You ask six uh, students, so the possible values for x are that um, you know, zero students out of the six have a class ring, one out of the six has a class ring, two out of six have a class ring, etc. But the most that you could, you know, end up, at most there could be six students who end up saying they have a class ring, and at the least zero if nobody has a class ring. But those are all, like, basically all the outcomes, all the possible values for our random variable x. And then we're wondering what the probabilities are in each of those. Uh, outcomes. So uh, we're going to start with x is 0 and plug in to the formula. Oh, and then just to be extra clear, so there have to, for each trial, there have to be two outcomes. So I'm considering each trial to be each person that you ask. Every time you ask a person, that's a trial. Success is they say, yes, I have a ring. Failure is they say, no, I don't have a ring. And so for that reason, the probability of success is 0.27, because they said 27% of high school students buy a ring. And then 1 minus 0.27, or in other words, 0 0.73, uh, is the probability of failure, because um, uh, well, because I guess 73% of students don't buy a ring. So here I'm plugging these things in. There are six total trials, because I ask six people, or you ask six people, so n is six. How many successes am I thinking about right now? Zero. Like, what's the probability that no one I ask has a ring? So zero is k. And then I explained why this was the probability of success, why this was the probability of the failure. This is k again, so that's why it's zero. We're looking for zero successes. And then this is n minus k, so that's why I plug in 6 minus 0. Using that combination formula, which you can get a couple slides back or from 10.5, you get this. I wanted to alert you to the fact that anything to the power of 0 is 1. That's why how we get this 1. 1 minus 0 0.27 is 0 0.73. 6 minus 0 is 6. That's how these show up. And then also, this front term just simplifies to 1 because 6 factorial over 6 factorial is 1. 
And zero factorial is also one that, that might be tricky to remember, but that is a special case. Um, and so this is one, this is one. We really just have to do 0 0.73 to the sixth. I would argue that this makes sense, mainly because um, there's only one way in which all six people can say no. All of them have to say no. The probability that each individual one says no is 0 0.73. That happens. Six, that has to happen six times. Um, so 0 0.73 to the sixth. So I oh to be clear, I took the answer we got in that last one and I placed it here in the table because that's where it goes. <clears throat> now I do the same calculation. Everything is the same except for k. Now I'm wondering what's the probability that there's one success. So n is still 6, um, but now k is 1, probability of success and failure are the same. Um, so when we simplify, here's what we get when we plug in to the combination formula. Summing to the power of 1 is still itself, and here I did 1 minus 0.27. 6 minus 1 is 5, that's how that exponent shows up. Okay, um, and then this right here simplifies to 6. These things here stayed the same, but this is something you could just plug into your calculator to get this number, and that's what's going to show up next in the table. Okay, we have that number. Yet again, n is exactly the same. Probability of success is exactly the same. Probability of failure is exactly the same, but now k, the number of successes we're looking for, is 2. So 2 and 2 and 2. That's why all those 2s show up. Same process. Here's the number I get. I'm going to place that in the table right here. Now, this is a separate example, but much of the text is the same. Same survey, still asking six people but the question is different. Um, what is the probability that at most two students have a class ring in their survey? So not exactly two. Basically they're asking what's the probability that zero, one, or two people have a class ring? Because all of those numbers are less than or equal to two. Um, there's no overlap either. Uh, in those situations. So when we want to find the probability of um, 0, 1, or 2 people having rings, you just have to add up the individual prob probabilities. Probability that 0 people have it, probability that 1 person has it, probability that 2 people have it. So I just take our values from the table and I add them up to get this and that's the probability that at most two students have a class ring. Um, final example is, is done. Uh, congrats on that. As always, please email me if you have questions. Look out for my uh, announcement about study week, about finals. Um, and uh, good luck with the exit ticket. Bye, everyone.